Hey, and welcome to Be The Bridge. I'm your host, Brian Payton Joyner. From the time I was 11, I tried to pray away the gay. But my senior year in college, I realized I could pray and be gay. Each week, I'll share my experiences and chat with others as we build a bridge between the LGBT community and people of faith. Thanks for joining, and let the construction begin. Hello, fellow bridge builders. Thank you all for joining me today for this special episode of Be The Bridge Podcast. I'm your host, Brian Payton Joyner, author of the novel The Wisdom of Stones, about Ben, a college senior who promised God and his meemaw he'd be a Southern Baptist preacher, but he can't pray away the gay. My guest today is someone who tried for many years to pray away the gay. Micah Myers grew up the son of a pastor's kid in Nebraska, and from the time he was first attracted to guys. He knew there was something wrong about it. For him, homosexuality was a sin that was so taboo it was never spoken about. But after his father died, Micah transferred from the University of Nebraska to the University of Memphis, and he came to realize, after meeting so many people who struggled with the same things he did, that he could be gay and Christian. Micah, welcome to the show. Pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. So, Michael, I'll ask you the question I ask all my guests to start out. Where are you from? Where were you born and raised? I grew up in Lincoln, Nebraska. Um, I was born in another state, but Nebraska is where I spent the vast bulk of my K-12 through years. So, I am a Husker. <laughs> Go Big Red. You can take the boy out of Nebraska, but you can't take the Nebraska out of the boy. Wow. Were you raised in a religious family? I would hope so. Um, right. <laughs> my, my father was a pastor, so yeah, uh, you know, or he wasn't doing a good job if I wasn't. Now, did he uh, actually have a church that you would go to? Because I know he was a campus pastor. Yeah, so this is kind of one of the, the funny things about being a, a campus pastor's kid is that we had two churches. So I had the church that I was registered as a member of with the ELCA, the Lutheran Church in America. Right. And then... We also had the church that he preached at. And so basically for most of my youth, we would go to a small local church in our neighborhood for Sunday school okay. and then drive to my dad's church to go to the second service there on campus. Oh, wow. So it was really non-traditional in the sense that like the, the small church that we went to didn't really have an active youth group. So I never did the like lock-ins, the <laughs> you know float trips, all that stuff I missed out on. But at the same time, Kind of for my entire life, I had like 200 older brothers and sisters who desperately missed their little brother from back home and wanted to like dote on me and play ping pong. Or so I tell myself. Yeah. Maybe, so that was the... Yeah. Go ahead. No, maybe it was me just harassing them until they gave in. Yeah. <laughs> so that was the demographic of the campus church. It was pretty much exclusively college students. Yeah, I mean, really 18 to 25 focused. You'd have kind of a few hangovers of people who went out into the world and because our parish churches don't usually do the best job of ministering to uh, single people in their, you know, mid twenties to late thirties, oftentimes they would come back to that church because that was the only community they could find. So I know my own experience, college and college guys were the things that really cemented my knowledge that I was gay. When did you first realize that you were attracted to other guys? Oh gosh, that's a loaded question. I think, you know, something I imagine most LGBT people deal with, and I'm, I'm audiobooking Call Me By Your Name right now, so <laughs> if that's any indication, then this is true. I definitely think it's, it's not attraction at first. It's sort of this infatuation, and perhaps straight people have the same thing, and they just have a name for it, and it's, you know, culturally understood that you're the prince looking for the princess or whatnot, but... I certainly remember being infatuated by men from a young age. and How, how old? Oh, like early tweens. Like I remember going to a, a musical theater production and there was one actor who was not a leading role. And I, and I remember like watching him the whole time and not understanding why. And, you know, I look back and I'm like, well, he was probably the best looking one in the cast. And, and you, for whatever reason... So I think it was it was more that, and the difference being that my infatuation, I knew 
was not something to lean into. You know, maybe straight people have that infatuation and know, oh, that means I'm attracted to them. Whereas for me, it was, I don't know what this is. This doesn't make sense. This shouldn't be happening. You know, I, men don't feel this way for other men. So it was definitely a lot of confusion. Mm -hmm. Let's unpack that statement of men don't feel this way about other men. Where did that notion come from that you shouldn't lean into what you were feeling, that it was wrong? Did you get that in that local church? Did you get that at all from your father or was that general society? So I talk a lot. I grew up mainline Protestant. And and so I had different experiences than I, I think a lot of American Christians had in the sense that I don't think I ever heard from the pulpit, you know, Sodom and Gomorrah and LGBT people are going to hell and these are horrible deviants. You know, in the Midwest, as I imagine many parts of America, we're quite passive aggressive. And so usually if there are things that are really taboo, mm -hmm. rather than confront them, we just ignore them. Right. And so that's sort of how I knew that being gay was something really bad because it was never spoken of. And so, you know, in my own church, I never, you know, sort of had that weekly lesson where that was the sermon that made you cringe, but I never heard a message of support. And so my go-to for an understanding was really just common culture. And that common culture was being, you know, a few hundred miles away from Westboro Baptist and living in a, a media culture that only showed gay people in negative lights. And so, you know, if we were watching a family movie and there was an LGBT character or an, uh, an implication that they might be, it was always spoken to in a negative light or spoken to in the movie, not by your parents. Oh no, no, by my parents and, and, okay. and family and, and, you know, peer group. And it was, you know, I remember, I remember my, my mom talking once about, some family friend who allegedly had dated John Travolta and, <laughs> and it was a man. And, and this was like, you know, whispered about and scorned and, you know, Oh, how this was so distasteful and just, so it wasn't a direct, like being gay is horrible. It was an indirect, never spoken about positively, no positive role models. I had nothing in the media or my culture or my school or any of my cultural spheres to show me otherwise. And so the predominant message that I got from my immediate culture and from my American culture was LGBT people are evil deviants that are out there to touch children and ruin society. Right. It's very interesting. You raise a point that I'm kind of obsessed with as I'm reading through the Bible. When you look at that concept you mentioned of taboo, that comes from Hebrew tovo, which I'm not sure if that's pronounced, but that's the word that we translate into abomination. And then when Paul talks about these things, he's really talking about the taboo associated with those things. Yeah. That doesn't mean that it is a sin. And, he, and then if you look at Corinthians in the passage yeah. where Paul talks about it, it's very <laughs> different in terms of how he talks about the taboo of gay or these taboos of men lying with men. And it's not treated as a sin. Yeah. But in our culture, we don't have, we don't really understand that difference, I think. Well, and this is why I love biblical literalists, because, you know, you talk to people and, and they say, well, I believe in the word of God. And I say, okay. And they say, you know, and I, and I take it for what it says. And I say, okay, so you speak Greek and Hebrew and Latin then? No. Oh, so you literally follow the interpretive English word of God. Right. Gotcha. So you're actually a non-literalist. No. You know, and it's like this. Yeah, we, we forget that um, English has not always been the world's dominant language. Right. And, and, and Shakespearean English in the King James Version, you can't really understand it. It has so many different word usage. And you just think about something like the word bad or sick. Yeah which traditionally have had negative connotations. But now you can say not as much bad, but now the new word is sick. We say, oh, that's sick, man. Yeah. And that means it's really cool. It's great. Well, and I think it's important to, you know, as soon as I sort of point that out to people, they say, well, then should we just throw out the entire Bible? And of course not. But Yeah, the slippery I, slope is yeah. a logical fallacy. Yeah. 
it something that people go to all the time and I've never understood it because that doesn't make any sense. What's your response to those people who say, well, we should just throw out the Bible then? Well, it's sort of tough. I mean, it depends on what level they're willing to be open. I've, I've found that oftentimes people who um, are the most sure about themselves being right are also the most unwilling to even entertain a different possibility which is why when I when I try to talk to people about maybe thinking differently about what the Bible says about LGBT people, the example I often like to give is that, you know, the truth, capital T, capital T, as so many people like to describe what the Bible tells us, the truth a thousand years ago said that, you know, if any sperm landed outside of a woman, you were kill, killing human beings because we didn't have science to tell us about sperm and an egg making a zygote that forms a human, we thought it was all contained within a man. Right. And um, I read something this week about, there's a conservative Christian, I wanted to say scholar or thinker, but that's probably not the case. A conservative Christian person who believes that masturbation is, is gay sex. Oh. Because if, if, a, if a straight guy is jerking off and he's in touch with his body and there's no woman there, then that means that he's having gay sex. So every man in history has had gay sex. <laughs> According to him, I guess. Yeah. It's a... Well, it's, you know, that example or how our, our attitudes have changed on women being allowed to speak in church or... Some places. Though. Well, yes, true. But it, even then, I think women are allowed to speak, which, right. is, which is a progression from what the truth said at one point right. or the truth saying that black people should be slaves. Right. And so showing these examples of how the truth has changed right. and saying, is it just possible? You don't have to tell me gay people are ordained by God and that they're okay, but is it just possible? Is there the smallest, slimmest chance that maybe in the future? And if they say no, it's so frustrating because it means they're unwilling. They're in such a rigid faith, which if you're so a thousand percent sure of the answer is it's called fact. It's not called faith at that point. So you actually aren't having a faith life. All right, that's a good you're, point. You're so in your own box and you're living in that world that you are not making any room for Jesus. Yeah. So, you know, if they're willing to even say that might be possible, then there's a dialogue. There's a chance to, to speak and just say, let's be open to what the Lord is speaking as the Lord has spoken for thousands of years and we are continuing to better understand, right. hopefully. I, I read something talking about religion versus science. And science is based on facts, mm -hmm. truths. Mm -hmm. Religion is based on facts, truths, and revelation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there has to be that revelational component. Mm -hmm. You might say, if all you're relying on is what you've been taught, where is that revelational moment? Why aren't you truly acting as a person of faith and trying to get that revelation, which... Did you have that in your life? What was it that shifted you from thinking it was wrong, taboo, mm. to accepting yourself as gay and then also believing that you could be a gay Christian? Yeah, I think the biggest thing, you know, after growing up in, in a culture to where, once again, my direct church never told me this, but it was picked up through, through media, through movies, through visiting other churches where maybe the pastor did give the Adam and Steve sermon. and you know, so I thought that I could pray it away, decades trying that. I thought uh, if I was just a better Christian, that I, it would fix me if I what met, did you met do the to right be a better girl. Christian? Uh, I, well, I mean, as a pastor's kid, obviously I'm already <laughs> a beacon of purity and perfection. Uh, you know, it just, you know, going to church more, going to more Bible studies, praying more if, you know, if you just... It's kind of like the saved version. Like if you just do the earthly actions that show you're a good Christian, then God will reward you. What age were you when this reached its pinnacle in your life? Uh, early 20s. Oh, okay. Um, wow. Yeah, I mean, I, I remember going away to college and being like, well, I haven't found the right girl in my hometown. Like maybe, maybe the girl that'll fix me is at college because... College, that's where you meet your spouse. You know, that's this is like our cultural idea. So did you go to the University of Nebraska? Uh, I spent one year at the University of Nebraska okay. when my dad was sick. And then when he passed, I transferred, um, never intending to stay in Nebraska. Because I, 
that one year I stayed in Nebraska, one time on the walk from my car to my first class, I counted how often I saw someone I knew. And every four seconds, I would say hi to someone and then start counting. And really, every four seconds, because between going to high school there, between growing up on campus, because my dad was the pastor, between just having, being part of a family that's well known in the community, it was like, I had no, I had no freedom to even consider exploring who I was outside of this structure of you are a Meyer. Right. So where did you go after that? And how did you decide to go to that particular school? Uh, I went to the University of Memphis, and I went there because they had a really great music program, and because my parents said, if you want to go to college, you have to pay for it on your own, and they gave me a full tuition scholarship, so I will always praise God, thank you, times a thousand, the University of Memphis, was it not for that scholarship, I would not have been able to go to college, I probably wouldn't even have come out, because if I had stayed in Nebraska, I don't know if my social construct would have allowed me the freedom. So when did you meet your first gay person at University of Memphis? I'm sure some people would would hear this story and think that how could God work through gay people? But one of the reasons I believe in God is because of this incredible experience that happened when I went to school. So my dad's name was Larry. And certainly now that's not a common name. I think in his generation it might have been. But something I've become really attuned to since his passing is watching for people who are named Larry. My husband's name was no, Larry. He changed it really? to Aldrich. Really? Yes. Well, that's creepy. Um, <laughs> in good ways. So I, I've had lots of really special experiences with people named Larry in my life. And this was the first one for me because I, I lost my dad during finals week of my freshman year. Wow. And it was only like, a few weeks before that, that I'd gotten the scholarship notice that I was going to Memphis. So I was able to tell my dad where I was going to college. Uh, I don't know how, how aware he was because of the drugs he was on at the time, but I remember, you know, speaking and he said, okay, that's where you're going, et cetera, et cetera. And a month before that letter came, I auditioned at the university of Memphis. I sang and I, I auditioned for a whole committee. And what I did not know at the time well, I'll save this till the end. It'll be better at the end. So I show up to my first class. Um, I'm a music major. I'm going to be in choir. I have to be in choir every day to keep my scholarship, two ensembles, voice lesson, all that. And I meet my choir director, whose name is Larry. Wow. Yeah, so it was a funny coincidence. And imagine my shock when I find out that um, Larry was having us all over to his house for an opening party, a choir party. And on the drive there, this this girl who offered to give my little Nebraska butt a ride because I was like one of the only students without a car, she said, oh, I hope Shane is there. And I said, who's Shane? She goes, he's his husband, idiot. <laughs> they weren't legally married at the time, but, um, and I just was like, like cleansed up because I'm like, oh my God, I'm going into this evil deviant's house. Oh, wow. Like, what? This isn't, this isn't cool. They didn't tell me this. And so I'm like, you know, from what I what I thought, I'm like, I'm going to go in, there's going to be whips and chains everywhere, and they're going to be wearing leather and Speedos. And I mean, like, this was the world I grew up in. I thought that, like, gay people couldn't be normal. And so I walk into their house, and of course, it's stunning. It's like, you know, designed immaculately. I'm afraid to touch anything. And and it was just the, the warmest, most hospitable place. Shane came out with, you know, a tray of hors d'oeuvres, and hey, what's your name? And and everyone there loved them so much. You know, and I'm terrified. A, because I'm a new person in a strange state and a strange culture. But I'm in this house that's like the epitome of sin from everything I've been told. Right. And all these people of diverse backgrounds, they seem so comfortable there. And they talk so lovingly about, about Larry and Shane. And it was, it was just the first time that my eyes had blinked. To even consider that LGBT people might be something other than horrible. Did you have that revelation that night and all of a sudden then were comfortable? Or was oh, no. Oh, through? God, no. I mean, I was at that party trying to figure out which of the choir girls I could date. Which oh, one would wow. cure me. It was a very slow process of 
of, you know, learning more about Larry and Shane and then meeting my LGBT classmates. And I think one of the really special things about going to the University of Memphis is that I lived in a town that even though I went to a pretty diverse high school, people always laugh. They think that's an oxymoron when I say Nebraska and diverse high school, but Lincoln High is where I went and we had a whole bunch of refugees. So I think at one point I read there, you know, there are over 20 different languages spoken first language was spoken by the students in my high school in any given year. So wow. it was a very diverse place, but still like people tend tended to hang out with their race. And so I went from a city that was 4% African Americans to a city that was 70% African Americans. So easily half of my classmates, half of the University of Memphis were black people. And I was just exposed to a whole new world of thought because the main people I interacted with were people who had grown up in a world that said, you are less than, you are unworthy, you are not smart enough, you are not clean enough, you are this, you are that, you know, a, a culture that was used to being put down. And so listening to their stories, it paralleled so much, I think, what it feels like to be LGBT. And, and I'm not saying they're the same thing. You know, I've had many conversations with with my African-American brothers and sisters who say, you have it so much easier because you can hide your minority. So I'm definitely not saying that they're the exact same, but it was a parallel that allowed me to start looking at the world and questioning. Right. And saying, oh, if these people have been treated in this horrible way, how have other groups been unfairly categorized? How, you know, and so it just started that wheel turning. And and a lot of them too were, were black and gay. And, Gosh, to hear their stories of coming out and their families abandoning them and the church, it was just, it was heartbreaking. So when did you get to that point where you were no longer looking for a girl to cure you and you started to accept that maybe Micah could pursue his attractions? Well, let's see. So I got to school in 19 and I was almost 22 when I came out. So I think it was, it was probably, I was like 21 and a half. And uh, I was, I was living in a Methodist student ministry at the time. Uh, I showed up at one point, my father's ministry in Nebraska was the largest Lutheran campus ministry in America. So I was used to seeing 150 students at worship on Sunday. And I showed up to the University of Memphis, and I learned that if you had 10 students come, you were a thriving organization, even in the South. You know, it was like campus ministries around the country tend not to be the size I was used to, um, not to be a size queen, but it was just, it was a shock. Like, <laughs> right. it re I was like, where, I walked up and said, where's the Lutheran campus ministry? And they said, what's a Lutheran? Because in a city of 1.7 million people, there were two ELCA Lutheran churches. I went from like the Lutheran motherland of the Midwest to every one of my friends was Baptist or evangelical, basically. So I was living in a Methodist student ministry, which was probably the most theologically progressive of, of all the campus ministries. And, you know, this whole process is, is also one of the reasons I believe in God, because as I was praying for God to reveal my wife, reveal the woman that would cure me, I was having all these other experiences where I was meeting people who grew up LGBT in the church and were now out right. and wow. hearing the process they went through. And, and this Methodist student ministry, one of the sparks I really remember was our pastor invited a, a lesbian who grew up super conservative in, in Arkansas and was now out and let her do a Q and a, and people asked some really offensive questions. You know, how do you know you're not straight if you've never been with a man? And she said, well, how do you know you're not gay if you've never been with a man? You know, and people <laughs> freaked out. She just, she really, she was so kind and gracious and not in your face. She was just so gentle with right. the audience. And I remember that. And, you know, people talked, well, you know, oh, well, she's nice and all. We should love her, but... You know, she's living in sin and, you know, but if we love her enough, she'll change her ways. And it was just, but it got me asking questions. And really, you know, I could talk for years about the, the, the resources I went to and the Bible verses and everything I looked into. But the, the big crux for me was I had all these African-American friends. A lot of my closest friends were black and they, 
I remember thinking, you know, the world has told you you're wrong and spoiled in so many ways. And you didn't choose to be black. And I was thinking, I had a, a cousin that had recently been diagnosed with schizophrenia. It, it was something that happens later in life. and so, and so de- Demon possession. Yes, basically. yes, yeah. And so she had been normal for, you know, so many, quote, normal for so many decades. And I'd known her in this way. And then, and then she had this diagnosis. And, and I remember thinking, well, she didn't choose that. You know, this... She didn't go out one day and say, I want to be a schizophrenic or what during biblical times we would say is possessed by a demon. And even cheesy stuff like my, I have one sister who's left-handed and we make fun of her for that because she's different. And thinking, well, she didn't choose that. And, and realizing that as hard as I've been trying to cure myself, as hard as I've been trying to find the right girl to pray it away, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I did not choose to have these feelings in fact, if anything, I was actively working every moment of my life to feel the opposite. Right. So if my black friends were not going to hell for being black, if my schizophrenic cousin was not going to hell for being schizophrenic, and my sister was not going to hell for being left-handed, how could I go to hell for being gay? Right. And that was really the biggest, that was among a sea of smaller moments, that was the biggest moment for me where I finally realized that I could be gay and not go to hell. And that was my biggest fear. And so once I, once I realized that there was a place, a space for me in heaven, everything changed. Wow. If you look at Stoicism back in the Greek times, that had a heavy influence on first century Christianity and especially on Paul. Homosexuality is unnatural, mm-hmm. but we don't understand the way that the word was used back then. Mm. The word was used to mean not the norm, not typical. Mm -hmm. And yes, if you say left-handedness, it's not the norm. Mm -mm. And being gay, schizophrenia, none of those things are the norm. Yeah. So according to Stoics, they were unnatural. Paul used that word. But our word for unnatural, the way we interpret it, is somehow contradicts the laws of nature. Not innate. Right. But in the Bible... That same word that gets translated unnatural was used to describe God's actions Mm. at one point. And it says that God acted unnatural, but it just means he acted atypical from the normal character. Well, and I love the exegesis, but I'm going to take it away from that for just a second. Sure. Because one of the things that I remember most about Memphis was that all of my friends asked me when I was saved. And as a, as a Lutheran, we do infant baptism and I say, well, I guess I was saved at my baptism or I thought about more. I thought, well, if God knows us before we're conceived, then I was saved even before I was conceived. And, and so that was something I kept thinking about is what what are they talking about? And then they often spoke about, well, you need to have, you'll know you're saved when you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And it was that phrase, which I've learned is like in the lexicon of evangelicalism, personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And so the more I thought about it, I kept thinking, well, God, I'm I'm praying to Jesus Christ every day. We're talking, I'm, you know, and, and the answer that I'm being given is that it's okay to be gay. So if you're telling me I need a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, and that's what I'm doing every day set all the theology aside. If, if my personal relationship with Jesus Christ has Jesus Christ saying, Micah, it's okay to be gay. Stop asking me. I've got more important things to deal with. (laughs) Right. Then how is that wrong? And if that is wrong, like how dare you come to me? I would never come to someone else and say your personal relationship with Jesus Christ is flawed. Right. It's like, okay, it's a personal relationship. Exactly. It's not. Exactly. Why don't you weigh in on how I should live my life? Right. Like, Jesus I know you said, yeah. look at that log in your eye. Don't be worrying about the speck in mine. Well, and like, just how, how offensive to be like, I know you've been praying about this your whole life and you've like considered killing yourself because it was so hard, but like, you're wrong. Wow. Like, what? <laughs> so let's finish that story. That moment that you said you were going to share that little factoid for later. Oh, well, so. Basically, going to Memphis changed my life in so many ways. It, it And I love, one of the reasons I love travel today is that I think the more we're 
exposed to people of differing thoughts and different norms, we realize that there are good people who are good, godly people who live their earthly lives different than us, and they're still good, godly people. And so that's really what Memphis was for me. It was so many ways what I needed to be able to live an authentic life. And so I'm so thankful for that. And was it not for that scholarship, I would never have gotten to go to Memphis. I would probably never be doing any of the things I'm doing today. And I found out years later, after getting to know Larry and Shane quite well, that when I auditioned, I walked out of the room, and I'm a countertenor, which is a male soprano, so it's it's really rare, and apparently I walked out of the door, and the room was silent. And no one said anything. And Larry turned to the committee and said, we have to do whatever it takes to get him here. Wow. Awesome. And so the first openly gay adult I ever met, not only did he have the same name as my dad, but he got me the financial means to go to school in Memphis. And so I truly believe that as God took away one Larry in my life, God gave me another Larry that I really needed at that moment. Wow. So what a very moving story. And it really brings us to why you're here sitting with me today in Palm Springs, California, because of your love for travel. Tell us a little bit about what you're doing now and that trip and where you're headed next. Yeah, so my dad was always a big fan of road trips and so when he passed, I didn't I was just 19. I had no concept of losing someone close to me, had never dealt with death in this capacity before and really was struggling with grieving. And so I didn't much know what to do and so I did the only thing that made any sense and I Climbed into his hail-battered Hyundai Elantra and took my first ever road trip to the glamorous locations of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, and Rochester, Minnesota. Oh, wow. So how far was that from Nebraska? Um, like four, like four to five hours drive. Okay. Um, you know, all in all, it was a week on the road. It was probably 20-some hours of driving, and I did it all for under 100 bucks. Wow. And I remember being so proud of that. Um, somebody once told me, they said, Micah, you're the most frugal person I know right after your dad. Um, so I was pretty proud that I had pulled it off for that price. Um, yeah, that was, that was the first road trip I'd ever done on my own. And it was such a a moving experience for me that I vowed I would do one road trip every year for the rest of my life around the time of my father's passing, both as a way to honor the road trips that he would no longer get by passing away at age 58 and also to honor the road trips I might never get if I also pass away before an age we would all hope. And so as I did these road trips, 19, 20, 21, 22, etc., and ventured a little further than Sioux Falls, really everywhere I went, if I met people who were 50 or older, they would say, what a great thing you're doing. Life really is short. We've lost so many friends unexpectedly. You never know which day will be your last. Good for you for doing this because that this is a lesson most people your age don't understand. And really, as I went throughout my 20s, I I realized that most of my peers did seem to think we were guaranteed to live to 80. And, you know, you're guaranteed to make it to retirement and have time to do things that take more than two weeks vacation. And so with my 20s coming closer to 30, I really wanted to do something with my annual road trips beyond just myself. And so I started plotting at age 28, you know, if I'm going to if I'm going to do something big to share this message with the world, this carpe diem lesson that I've been fortunate to learn through this tragedy in a way that helps them learn it in a less tragic way, what is that thing going to be? And there's there's lots of of stories you can look up to find out more details, but basically what I ended up doing was on April 29th, 2016, the 11th anniversary of my father's passing. I moved my entire life into a white windowless cargo van and committed to living in that cargo van for three years as I would drive around the country, travel to all 56 states and U.S. territories in an attempt to set a world record as the youngest person to ever visit all of our National Park Service sites, all 417 of them. 
And so that journey has been happening for the past two years. And I'm here in Palm Springs because I just visited Joshua Tree National Park as site number 308 wow. <laughs> out of those 417. Has the focus of your trip changed since you started almost two years ago? So I like to, to talk about being open to God in ways that we might not expect. I prayed about this journey for years. I sort of prayed that if there were any other jobs or things I could do with my life, they sounded a lot easier than this. I know this probably sounds like a giant vacation, but in reality, it's been one of the toughest projects I've had to do in my entire life, just because of the amount of, of work and time that it takes, even just logistically, to pull it off. Right. And I've, and I've seen your van. It's, it's, it's not, not glamorous. Yeah, it's not luxury <laughs> no. conditions. I think we were joking no. about the... The closet in this house that you're staying here oh, in Palm Springs is larger than your space in your van. It is the closet so larger people than People think it's a, a luxury vacation trip. They are sorely mistaken. Yeah, my dad was a, a mechanic and a carpenter by hobby, which, God, I could have used when I was building this cargo van into a, quote, apartment on wheels. Uh, I have two degrees in music, in classical music, and basically uh, YouTube and a lot of tenacity and a lot of... The maintenance guys, I was living in a boarding school when I built the van, and oftentimes I would do something, and the maintenance guys would come over and laugh at me and then fix it. <laughs> so uh, it's not glamorous by any means, but it gets the job done. You know, I'm living in a van because I am doing this journey on a shoestring and a prayer. Basically, I saved up as much as I could throughout my 20s, and when I launched this, National Park experts told me I had only saved up one-fifth of the amount of money it would take to do it. But I thought, well, you know... Just so coincidentally, the year I turned 30 also happened to be the 100th anniversary of the National Park Service, and I was very Pollyanna in my late 20s, and genuinely believed that if I just went out and did it, that all these companies would jump on board, and you know, a health insurance company would sponsor my health insurance, and an RV company would donate the RV, and a food company would give me unlimited access at their restaurants, and I just, I just believed that if you put out goodness into the world, the world would give it back to you. And the world shot me down hard. I wrote 800 different companies trying to any inroads, any tie in to road trips or national parks that I could. And ultimately, they all said, this is a great project, such wonderful tie ins, culturally relevant, but you are not famous and don't have 100,000 Twitter followers. So we don't care. Right. <laughs> and so I began this journey, always conscious that somehow I had to fundraise or it was going to end. I wouldn't complete the, the goal. And, and found that as I, as I did media, because I thought that would be the way I could drum up support was to do, do newspapers and TV interviews and people would hear about it and they would donate because that's what we see on TV and we see these GoFundMes and it just seems Pollyanna magical. Uh, I found very quickly that as people read my story, they thought that I, they called me, they would comment, they would email me and called me a, a lazy millennial, a trust fund brat. And oftentimes I would say, did you even read the article? I don't know any pastors that pass on trust funds, maybe other than Joel Osteen or, you know, some of these mega church, but definitely not a Lutheran campus pastor. And so very quickly I realized that that using the media to try to share this journey, what I was hoping to to help the world with it was not working. But as I met people in person and I would tell them, they'd see my van, they'd ask what I was doing and I would explain what I was doing and why I was doing it. People would just reach into their wallet and hand me a $20 bill. And so I realized that when, when I shared the story, people were really excited about it and wanted to be a part of it. And so I thought, well, I should probably start speaking about this. And I had been a Rotary scholar in college and started speaking at Rotary clubs and would get no donations. Every single Rotary Club I went to, people would say, what a great story, that's wonderful, and no support. And so I was just fledgling, because I did, I did not know what to do. I was 10, 11 months into this journey, and was running out of money, and was you know only 100 parks in. So what was the big transformation? Well, when I when I left my jobs in D.C. to start this project, one of those jobs was singing at the Washington National Cathedral. And I told my choir director there that I was going to have to quit, and I thought he'd be irate. But 
very quickly he he kind of pondered it and he said and you're trying to fundraise from the road right he said why don't you sing along the way he said go to churches and sing sing for your supper put out a basket he said i'm sure they'll get you to the next park and basically i had forgotten in all the hustle and bustle of blogs and photos and media and and traveling and where am i going to shower where am i going to sleep i i just forgot about that until i was sort of out of luck and so I wrote a friend who is a, a priest in Fort Lauderdale, and I said, hey, in two months I'm coming down to to Fort Lauderdale. Can I sing for your church? Here's this idea. And he said, yeah, absolutely. Go for it. We'll get you to the next park. And I showed up that morning, and not only – so the accompanist did not show up. Oh, no. <laughs> and so – the priest said, can you sing to the accompaniment backing of your YouTube videos where you're singing the same song? So I was singing along with a recording of myself while the video played on the church projection screen. And I'm just thinking, oh, God, Micah, don't mess up because they'll all know because it's right there. And and then we get to the sermon and this is the middle of the service. And my friend, the priest comes up to me and says, you know, I'm going to go up and introduce the sermon and, and just talk very briefly. And then I'm going to invite you up to preach with no warning. Yeah. And I'm thinking, <laughs> are you crazy? And I'm like, you must've been out with the accompanist last night and he could sleep in, but you had to come to church and at least show face. Cause somebody has got to do communion. But I'm like, you are nuts. And he's like, no, no, you'll be fine. He said, you know, just tell him about, tell him about your story and about what you're doing and, and tie it into the gospel somehow. It, 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 you'll be fine. <laughs> I'm like, you are crazy. But so I got up in the pulpit and I started talking. And by me talking, I mean the Holy Spirit started talking because Lord knows where I was at that moment. But I just, I shared my story and, and I talked about what I was doing and why I was doing it. And then about growing up in Nebraska as a pastor's kid who was closeted and what it was like in the church. And, and afterwards people came up to me bawling and they said, you know, I've got a, a gay son. I've got a lesbian niece. I've got a transgender uncle. Wow. And I have never thought I could talk about them until now. Or they, they'd say, you told my story today during the sermon. Oh. I got to hear my story during so the So that was a watershed week. moment for you, speaking at that church for the first time. It was. Well, it was it was huge in the sense that it, I guess it, it showed me that, that my personal story growing up in the church could help other people. Um, I think oftentimes we forget that there's a, a massive power in just speaking our own truth and our own experiences and sharing them with people, much like I experienced in Memphis from my African-American classmates who just told me their truth, their life stories. And it changed my life in so many ways. And so that was, that was a big moment. And then I got to the next park, you know, they were, they were really excited to help a, a quick, a quick side note. So right around the same time that that happened, I also got an Instagram message from a kid who said, I'm 15 years old, I go to a private Baptist school in Texas, and I'm not out to anyone. And I'm like, okay, you're all my classmates from college. So he did not know that you were gay at that point. You were not out on your on your Twitter. I, I uh, sort of. I mean, in my 20s, I started a group for young adult LGBT Christians called Queer for Christ which had done pretty well in the Washington, D.C. area. So if you Googled me, I you could find out that I was gay quite easily. Um, but I was certainly, I was definitely hiding it from my National Parks journey because I thought if I'm going to get, you know, people who want to donate or companies to, to buy into this, I have to be as, you know, clean and non-offensive as possible. And this could be offensive, so no way. And And this kid wrote and said, you know, I, I, I read about who you are and your group and I just want to thank you because now I know that I can be ordinary when I grow up. Wow. And then that, he, that was his goal. Ordinary. Right. Just, right. just to be just, ordinary, just, just to exist. Wow. 
And then he said, and, and I see you setting world records, and I also know now that I can be extraordinary. Wow. It so, in one message, showed me everything that maybe God had been nudging me towards. I realized that my whole life I had only seen on TV and in the newspapers what my concept of LGBT people was. That's where I got it. I didn't get it from from people talking about it. I didn't get it from my church. I got it from the media. And so I now had a chance as civil rights leader, Marion Wright Edelman preached at the 2015 ELCA youth gathering. It's hard to be what you can't see. And I now had a chance to be what 10 year old Micah, what 15 year old Texas Baptist student, what people around the world who never saw themselves needed to see, and I could use this National Park's world record journey to create that. Right, wow. And so <clears throat> that happened right around the same time as this first church visit. Yeah. Well, I think this is actually, you know, I mean, we we can keep going, but this could... This could... So, Micah, what... So, Micah, what a very compelling and moving story. I am super excited that I was able to meet you and sponsor you a little bit along your journey. I know my listeners are and they better want to sponsor you because you you have a very important message and getting it out in a unique way. And I know at the end of this trip, all the people that have helped contribute towards your success are going to share a little portion of that. And we're going to be excited because we're going to give you a national, international platform to go out and, and preach that message that it's okay to be gay, period. And not only that, but you can be gay and Christian. So if people want to find out more about your story, but most importantly, help you as you try and finish up this last third of your journey, what can they do? Yeah, so the cool thing is that at the same moment I got this message and this new mission as part of my journey to to be this openly gay Christian role model, I was running out of money. But God provided. I've been speaking at churches now for about a year and a half across the country and those churches that support from America's Christians has allowed this gay man to keep going down the road, (laughs) you know, another 200 parks. And so, uh, so I really have to thank, thank the Christian community for, for supporting me. And, And there are people of other communities that have, that have helped as well, but really it's, it's people who have seen what I'm putting out there, what I'm able to use this trip to do and, are supportive of sharing a message of God's inclusive love for all people, including LGBT people, and really want me to complete this journey. So if listeners want to be a part of that, if you want to to be part of that group of people that made this possible, you know, I would not be here without all the support of all these people. So yes, this is my journey, but it's also all of our journeys. If they want to be a part of that, they can they can do so at my website, uh, micahmeyer.com. And I have basically a GoFundMe style fundraiser that's, there. And that's M I K A H M E Y E R. Yeah, M I K A H M E Y E R. And you can type it into Google or your favorite social media platform and you'll find me there. There's only one other person named Micah Meyer, and uh, she's a, a Mormon in Utah. So as long as it's me and not her, then you found the right Micah Meyer, M I K A H M E Y E R. But yeah, I, I'm in a big fundraising push right now to go to Alaska. It's my 50th state of this journey. It's the most expensive by far because there are 23 park service sites there and only six of them can be reached by vehicle. So the other 17, I have to take bush planes, boats, and backcountry tours. And, you know, these bush planes are two to $3,000 a day to rent, like $1,500 a flight hour. So it, this is my huge hurdle to get over this. So, you know, it's it's... On the way there, you know, $10 gets me to be able to eat at a Panera Bread with Wi-Fi so I can upload pictures and and plan logistics that night. Um, $50, well, with the exception of California, $50 fills up my tank. In California, it's like $70. Right, it's right. crazy here. Um, and, and yeah, well, you know, whatever people have on their hearts, if they, if they want to help make sure this project reaches completion and, and then I'm able to keep sharing this message and use this platform that this park strip has allowed me to have to keep spreading the good news, the gospel. Um, this past week I was on the Today Show. I was interviewed by Jenna Bush, George Bush's daughter. And 
multiple people emailed me and said, you got Jenna Bush for Klempt. Like she was both in the interview and live. She was tearing up. Right. And I just think what an amazing opportunity that is for people around the country and world who know George Bush and know him as, as, you know, professing one thing about LGBT people probably, and to see his own daughter emotionally invested in the story of a gay Christian, like how I could have used that as a child to see that, like, like that's one of the warmest feelings I get from this project when it's hard, when I'm sleeping in the van, I'm freezing to death, or I'm, you know, heating here in the 101 degrees in Palm Springs. Like those are the moments that keep me going because I remember 10 year old Micah and the 15 year old student and realize that because of sweating it out at this moment, because of staying up late and editing photos, I'm able to be that light in the darkness for people. So if you want to be part of this journey, if you want to join this journey and see the entirety of America from the smartphone to your palm, you can do so at micahmeyer.com, M-I-K-A-H-M-E-Y-E-R. All right, great. Hey, thank you so much for being here today. Thank Can't you. Can't wait to share your message with my listeners and others. Thank you so much for having me. I love being here. Thanks for listening to Be The Bridge. If you enjoyed the show, I'd love a positive rating and review on iTunes. I appreciate your support and feedback. For more details, visit brianpaytonjoiner.com or follow me on Facebook or Twitter. The links are in the show notes. Have a great week. And as my grandpa used to say, if you live life by your own rules, you're going to be okay. <laughs>